الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قال ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إن لم لم المسلمين ربي شلي صدري ويسل لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفكى وكولي I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla and the Peace TV Chinese as well as the viewers on my social media platforms which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, the Twitter and the Alida platform. I welcome all the viewers with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God beyond all of you. I welcome you to this program Ask Dr. Zakir Season 9 Session 6. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have asked and you are unable to reply or any question that you find in the media which requires a clarification, this is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of my social media platform, but the best would be to ask as a subscriber on the Alida platform, the chances are the maximum that it would be replied. And next is asking a question on the WhatsApp, there are high chances that it would be selected. You are most welcome to ask your question in brief on the WhatsApp as a text message mentioning your name, your profession and the city and country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. We'll take the first question from the Alida platform. First question is from Brother Omar, EMT, paramedic trainee from Hamburg, Germany. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I had a discussion with a brother about the Sunnah Salah before Jummah prayers. I showed him some fatwas which state that there is no Sunnah Salah before Jummah. But he rejected it with the argument that these scholars and sheikhs are Salafi or Wahhabi because they studied in Saudi Arabia and he said that such kind of scholars are not good to follow because they reject the four madhabs. Is this true? Are the fatwas from such scholars and or Salafis and Wahhabis not good? I mean they all say that they are from Ali Sunnah Wal Jama. Since I am a revert it was very hard for me to get the amount of knowledge which a Muslim needs. Also, the sources here in Germany are very less. So I learned from sheikhs on YouTube, from LA Sunnah Wal Jama, and platforms like Al Hidaya and Islam QA. I fear Allah Azza wa Jal and do not want to do something wrong, including to acquire bad or false knowledge, but not with this statement. I do not know if my knowledge which I acquired is right. So is it wrong to look at the four madhab and do what and do that in what they all agree? And if they look for, and if they differ, to look for the most correct opinion in Quran and Sunnah through fatwas from scholars like Al Munajid, Al Turafi, Ibn Taymiyyah, Albani, etc. And act on this kind of knowledge. Don't we have to check the evidence of the fatwas of the madhabs, or should we just stick to one madhab and just follow it? What is the true and right Islam? Do we have to follow a madhab? What is the way to Jannah? Also, which scholars are meant by the majority of scholars? Please clarify so that my doubts may disappear after the dispute. Jazakallah khairan. Brother Umar is a person who regularly asks questions on the Alida platform. 
I need a reward. Before I answer to his main question, I would like to touch on his question that he said that he had come to know through research that there is no Sunnah Salah before the Jummah Salah. And what he says is correct, that there is no Sahih Hadith which, or any Quranic verses which say that there is any Sunnah Salah before the Jummah Salah. And he's right. That, and if your friend differs, you should ask him to show proof. If what you say, he says that what fatwa you have got is wrong, you should ask him, produce your proof. Produce a hadith from Bukhari or Muslim which says there is a Sunnah Salah. So what your research has said is correct, that there is no Sunnah, there is no Sunnah Mawqadah or Gair Mawqadah which is prescribed by the Prophet before the Juma Salah. However, there is two rakat Tahiyatul Masjid which is very important. And there is a hadith in which a person enters the mosque and while the Prophet was giving the Juma Qutbah, he enters the mosque and he sits down. The Prophet stops his Qutbah and asks him, did you read, did you offer the two rakah, referring to the two rakah of Tahiyatul Masjid? And the man replied, no. So the Prophet said, get up and offer. So, two rakat Tahiyatul Masjid is a requirement. That's the normal, whenever you enter a masjid, either you start your salah directly, or if you have to sit, you have to read two rakat Tahiyatul Masjid. So this two rakat Tahiyatul Masjid, before offering, before the Juma Salah, is required. There is no other Sunnah Salah. But, if you want, you can offer any Nafil or Nawafil. It is your option. It's not recommended, but if you want to read any other Salah, example, Istikhara, or any particular Salah, or Nawafil Salah, you are permitted. But there is no prescribed Sunnah Salah before the Juma Salah. Now coming to your main question, that your friend was saying that you should not listen to scholars from Saudi Arabia because they are Wabis, because they are Salafi, and they don't believe in the four madhab. He is totally wrong. I've been to Saudi Arabia, I've met many scholars from Saudi Arabia. It's totally wrong to say that they do not believe in the four Imams or the four Madhab. In fact, the true scholars, whichever part of the world they may be, whether they're from Saudi, from India, from Pakistan, Alhamdulillah, they respect all the four Imams. And all the four Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on them all. They were great scholars and we love them and respect them. So to say that the Saudi scholars do not respect or believe in the four madhab is totally wrong. What a Muslim should do is follow the Quran. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 59, Atiullah wa Atiyu Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And those who have been given the authority, Ulul Amr. But the verse does not stop there. Obey Allah, obey the messenger and those who have been charged with authority. But the verse continues. But if they differ, those charged with authority means the scholars. And the verse continues. If they differ, go back to Allah and his soul. So the complete verse says, obey Allah and obey the messenger. And to understand what Allah and his messenger say, we have to refer to the scholars. But if the scholars differ, what do you have to do? You have to go back to Allah and his soul. So, what you were saying, that you look at the four madhaibs and if all the four madhaib, if they say the same thing, there's no difference of opinion, fine. But if they differ, you refer to scholars like Sheikh Salim Munajjid, like Sheikh Abdul Aziz Torefi, like Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah and Sheikh Albani. Alhamdulillah, you are right. You are following the Quran and Sunnah. If your friend says that they are wrong, he should get proof from the Quran and Sunnah that what the fatwas these great scholars are giving is against Quran and Sunnah. Just by saying they are wrong, who is he? He is just a layman. Now coming to a basic question, that should we follow one madhab and stick to it? Or do we have the right to choose which scholar is correct? Generally, all of the scholars agree that if you are a person If you are a person who has the knowledge of the deen, then you have the right, 
to choose and suffer for yourself. But if you're a layman, then you don't. If you are a person who has the knowledge, you have the right. Generally, if you ask me, maybe 50 years ago, when the media wasn't advanced, I would categorize the Muslim Ummah into four categories. And I've given this answer in detail in my earlier session. I'll just summarize in brief. That maybe 50 years back when the media was in advance, when there was no internet, when there was no social media, I would personally classify the Muslim Mumma into four categories. One, the lowest category is the person who is a namesake Muslim. He may not be aware of his deen. He is just a Muslim for namesake and may not be a practicing Muslim also. The second category is the person who is a practicing Muslim. He follows the deen, but he does not do research. He does not inquire much. He has no ability to check. The third category would be a student of knowledge who has gone to an Islamic university or done his bachelor's or master's or done PhD. And the highest category are the scholars. These scholars who nearly have the acumen and they are mushtahid. So, but naturally the last two categories, 50 years back, I would agree that since they don't have knowledge and they don't have access and they cannot check, they should follow one particular madhab, I have no objection. But those who are students of knowledge and those who are scholars, but natural, if they find that one particular madhab certain ruling they feel is differing, they can check up with the authentic sources of Quran and Sunnah, they can refer to other scholars and choose which is the correct methodology. Today, since science and technology has advanced, media has advanced, today I would divide the Muslim Ummah into six categories. Number one is again those Muslims who are namesake Muslims, they may not be practicing Muslims, they may not be following most of the rulings of Islam, but they call themselves Muslims. The second category, they may be practicing Muslim, but they don't actually check whether what they hear from their scholar is correct or not. They don't have the acumen, they don't have the ability to check. So these two groups which are there, the lowest category, like before, I would advise them that since they don't have the ability, they don't have the resources, they don't have the knowledge to check, then they can just follow one particular madahib and all these four madahib are alhamdulillah established and they are alhamdulillah great scholars. They can follow one madahib, I would say is right. But since science and technology is advanced, the media is advanced, the third category of Muslim are those Muslims who after hearing something, they would like to research, they would like to check that this particular fatwa given by this particular scholar, this particular madhab, is it, is it following the Quran, is it following the Sunnah, they may not have the knowledge to decipher right or wrong, but they can read and they can search on the internet. They go on the internet, they ask the people and today everything is on a fingertip. So these, so this category, the third category, may not be very knowledgeable, but since they have that urge to check up, they read other sources, they can go on the website and very well once they get the answers of two different scholars, they themselves can go in the Quran, check up, they can go, they may not have knowledge of the Quran, they may not have, but surely the basic logic they can use and they would fall in the third category like those Muslims who are practicing Muslim and who like checking up and they have access to checking. Then the third category would be, a, sorry, the fourth category, I would say the higher category, that means they are very well versed and very savvy with the internet, they are very savvy with the Islamic websites, they are very savvy with how to go and check on the net whether hadith is sahi or not. They have knowledge that if you go to sunnah.com, you can come to know hadith is sahi or not, you can go to Islam QA and you can check what the scholars say and you can refer, you can go back to various websites, you can see the translation. These are more savvy and they have been doing for many years so they know how to decipher to a certain level what is right what is wrong this would be the fourth category the fifth category would be the student of knowledge In the fourth category, those who are internet savvy and check, they may be among those who are dais and who can check and who can verify. 
the fifth category would be the student of knowledge. Student of knowledge, I refer to those people who have gone to universities and who have got a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD degree. Many people call them scholars, I call them a student of knowledge. They are not scholars, but, but they know the basics of fiqh, of usul -e fiqh, etc. And they are capable enough to decipher. So when they find that two scholars are differing, they can go to the evidence of both these scholars and check up for themselves which is correct and they have that knowledge of at least deciphering that which Dalil is more acceptable as for Quran and Sunnah. So this would be the fifth category which I call a student of knowledge. And the last and the highest category are the scholars. They are really Fuqahas. They have spent a lot of years in research and, the, and in scholars agree the different. They are scholars in Usul al-Fiqh. They are scholars of Hadith, they are scholars of Tafsir, they are scholars of Islamic finance, they are scholars of comparative religion. So in this field of scholar, there are different speciality. So each scholar is specialized in his field of Hadith, or Tafsir of Quran, or Fiqh, etc. So each scholar has specialized and they are the highest category. So today because science and technology is advanced, the first two categories were namesake Muslim and may not be practicing Muslim, may be practicing very little. Or the second category who practices Islam but not interested in research, don't have the ability, don't really look at it. These two first two categories, previously, maybe 50 years back, when science and technology was in advance, media was in advance, I would say that more than 75% of the Muslim Ummah would fall in the first two categories. And maybe less than 25% in the third or fourth, third or fourth category, student of knowledge or scholars. Today, as I said, there are six categories. I would say that less than 25% would fall in the first two categories. Less than 25% fall in the first two categories. And the remaining more than 50, more than 75% of the Muslim Ummah would fall in the third, fourth, fifth or sixth category. The scholars are very few, just a small percentage, a minute percentage. The student of knowledge may be more, maybe 5 to 10 percent, but the majority, that is more than, you could say approximately two-thirds of the Muslim Ummah, they would fall in the third and the fourth category. That means they have access to the social media, they would like to know what is right or wrong, and when they hear anything, they, do, they don't just agree blindly, they check it up. So, since two-thirds of the Muslim Ummah fall in the third and the fourth category and more than 75% in the third, fourth, fifth and sixth category. What I understand from the Umar who is a revert, I would put him in the category three. That means I feel he's a practicing Muslim and he knows how to go on the website and he says in this question, he goes to Islam QA, he goes to the al platform and he refers to the fatwas given by Sheikh Salim Munajid or by Sheikh Abdul Surafi, or Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, or Sheikh Nasr al Almani, he's on the right track. I would put him in the category three. So, your friend who told you all these things, I would put him in category two. He may be a practicing Muslim, he may not know how to refer, he may not know how to argue. That's why I say, okay, these scholars are wrong. If he really knew, he would give references. Okay, this hadith of Sahih Bukhari says that there is a sunnah, salah, before you offer the Juma prayers. Instead of saying that, he started accusing, starting laying allegation against others, which is totally wrong. So, Brother Umar, you're on the right track, what you're doing. And as a Muslim Ummah as a whole, we have to respect all the four Madhaibs. We have to respect all the four Aymas. They were great scholars. May Allah have mercy on them all. They were great Fokahas. And they have done a great deal of research and have helped the Ummah codified. But no human can be 100% perfect. If this happens, then what you do, you follow the verse of the Quran of Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 59. Atiullah, Atiur Rasul, obey Allah and obey the messengers and those who have been charged with authority. All these four emmas surely come under the category of those who have been charged with authority. But the verse does not end there. It says, if they differ, if these scholars like the four imams, if they differ, go back to Allah and the Rasul. So you, as a layman, may not have the ability to decipher who is right or who is wrong. But now, since technology is easy, you have the ability to know what the scholars have spoken about the differences. 
and believe me all the four am advocate scholars more than 90 percent time they are saying the same thing or you would say 95 percent time they are saying the same all of them say pray five times all of them say that you have to give zakat all of them say you have to fast there may be difference in maybe five percent of the issues so 90 to 95 percent all the four IMRs, they, are, they say the same things. So, when there is difference in about 5% or less than 5% things, at that time is the question, who do you follow? So, if you belong to the first two categories, who are who not practicing Muslim, doesn't have knowledge of the deen, or the second category that who is a practicing Muslim but doesn't want to research, doesn't have the access, doesn't know what to do, then if he follows one particular mother, whether the Hanafi mother, or the Maliki Madhab, or the Shafi Madhab, or, or the Hamli Madhab, no problem. Because he doesn't know. But if you belong to the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth category, or I would put you in the third category, you know that we have to respect all the four Imams, they are great scholars, but when they differ, you have to find out which is right. And both cannot be right if they are contradicting. So in this time what you do, you refer to the other scholars, like Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, like Nasruddin al-Bani, like Sheikh Salim Manajid, like Sheikh Abdul Nistarefi, you are right. Or uh, uh, Sheikh Hassan Dadu, all these are great scholars and they too may differ. So this time you can see the evidence and analyze the evidence. You, since you belong to the third category, you may not be that much well versed in analyzing. So what you have to do, you can go to other platforms like Ali Daya, like Islam Q&A and see the evidence and then you see that the other school which says the evidence is not is that strong and when you give, know that they are giving references from Bukhari, from Muslim, from Quran and giving the explanation so you are not a layman like category 1 or 2 you can very well analyze so what you are doing is perfectly right don't believe in your friend he is lower than you he is you may be a revert you may be new to Islam may have accepted Islam just a few years back but Alhamdulillah, I feel your knowledge of Islam is more and you are a person who likes to do research. So continue doing that, you are on the straight path and we have to follow the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And when the scholars differ, try and find out which is right. That is the best methodology and I would like to tell you, Mashallah, Brother Omar, you are on the right track and be on the track and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may give you more knowledge more Iman, you practice the Deen and may grant you the Firdaus. <coughs> the next question. My name is Muhammad and I am from Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. I am a high school student. You are one of my favorite Islamic scholars and your videos cleared many of my doubts. May Allah give you good health and a long life. Amen. In Hinduism, there are multiple paths you can choose from to glorify God. You can choose any of those paths. You can worship any way you want and glorify God in your own way. In Islam, there is only one path. And you can only follow what the Quran and Sunnah say. You cannot follow your own way in Islam. Why does Hinduism provide people the liberation and freedom to reach divine power and glorify God any way they want but not Islam? Everybody is different and has different needs. So why does Hinduism provide multiple parts to people and not Islam? The brother asked a very important question that in other religions including Hinduism you have multiple ways where you can pray and worship God. In Islam you have only one way Quran and Sunnah. There are various options how you can worship and how you can follow the religion. In Islam, there is only one way, Quran and Sunnah. So why Hinduism is so broad-minded and has various ways you can do and why is Islam so restricted? First, let me clarify 
that alhamdulillah the only religious scripture on the face of the earth which has maintained its pure authentic form is the glorious quran according to william moore who is a very well known critic of islam though he is the critic of islam about 200 years back he said there is no religious text on the face of the earth which is as pure as the glorious quran for 12 centuries imagine 200 years before william moore who is a critic of islam mentions honestly that no religious text has maintained its pure form for 12 centuries like the quran so all the scriptures that are there of the other religions according to their own scholars whether it be the bible whether it be the veda whether it be bhagavad gita whether it be the upanishad whether it be the talmud whether it be the buddhist scriptures or the jewish scriptures or the christian scriptures or the hindu scriptures their scholars themselves say that their scripture is not in the pure form quran is the only religious scripture on the face of the earth which is 100% pure and is not adulterated it is not changed and allah says in the quran in surah hijr chapter number 15 was the nine that we have revealed the quran allah says and we shall guard it from corruption so this is the only religious scripture on the face of the earth which is in its pure and pristine form now coming to your question that hinduism you can worship god the way you want and the different types etc the highest scripture in the hindu religion are the vedas and i have given a talk on the concept of god in the major world religions and in this concept of god i have told clearly that if you analyze the scriptures even though the scriptures of the other religions though they have been changed though they adulterated yet the main portion of tawhid which is there in islam is mentioned in all these religious scriptures even though they are changed even though they are adulterated the main concept of tawhid is there and all the religions the cornerstone actually is tawhid believing in one god so even the veda says you have to believe in one god you should not make any idols you should only worship him but in the other scriptures you may find other things mentioned which are lower in authority there may be contradictions and because they have not been maintained in pure form you find many interpolations have taken and many things have been added whether it be the bible whether it be the other scriptures that is the reason you have a variety Islam is there in its pure form. That's the reason in Islam the concept of worship is very clear. It believes in tawhid. And this concept of worship in Islam is also present in the Hindu scriptures. The same thing. It says na tatsya patimasti. Of that god there is no image. Mentioned in Yajurved chapter number 32. Verse number 9. It's mentioned in Sita Sar Upanishad. and in various places that god has got no images yet you find that the hindus they make idols etc you find the other lower scriptures which says that so even in hinduism and in christianity all the other scriptures it talks about the monotheism which is there in islam now coming to your second part of the question so in actual form the main worship is tawhid it is there in all the religion and you can refer to my video cassette concept of god in major world religions and the concept of allah subhanahu wa taala our creator our sustainer our cherisher is the same because of the interpolation that came later on you find there have been many additions but quran has maintained its pure form now coming to a second question that there are variety of things that is there in in hinduism and islam is restricted this is a misunderstanding in fact in islam there are few do's and don'ts only few everything else is optional and in the major do's and don'ts there are only 70 and the hadith of ibn abbas may allah be pleased with him he said that there are seven major sins and 70 is more correct in number than seven so there's a book written there's a book written by imam abhabi on on al qabair the major sins and he listed the 70 major sins in order and there are 70 major sins 
There are some scholars who have added and increased the number to more than 100, etc. But basically, there are 70 major do's and don'ts. So in the 70 major sin, all the major farais are mentioned. All the major sins are mentioned. So these 70 are actually the major rules and regulations of Islam. If you follow and see to it that you do not do the 70 major sin, it will include all the major farais. That is believing in Tawheed, that is not doing shirk, that is praying five times salah, that is fasting in the month of Ramadan, giving, giving the qad, performing hajj if you have to do, and all the major farais are there. And the major haram, what you should not do is mentioned. So the major important things, there are only 70 major do's and don'ts. The remaining, all optional. Then you may have the minor sins and you may have the other things which are mustahab. So in the minor sin, there may be maybe a few hundred. So if you analyze all put together, maybe a few hundred rules and regulations, maybe a thousand, that's it. But there are hundreds of million things you can do. 10 million things, 100 million things, everything is optional. So the rules and regulations in Islam, there are very few do's and don'ts. And everything is optional. So for you to say that Islam is restrictive or you know, it is not as compared to Hinduism or other religion, I feel is wrong. In fact, Islam is more specific. That these are the few do's and don'ts, everything else is optional. And what you have to analyze, that it's very clear cut. And all these benefits you in this dunya and your akhirah. And alhamdulillah, all these rulings are obtained from Quran and Sunnah. So to say that you have to follow Quran and Sunnah, yes, you're right. But the Quran and Sunnah is so specific and it says very clearly that these few things you have to compulsory do, these, these few things you have to abstain from, and the remaining is optional. There are a few hundred things you do, it is preferable, it is mustab. There are a few things you do, it is makhru, it is preferable you don't do, other things are optional. So it becomes much more easier to follow and for this there is a reward. So if you follow the deen, to follow Islam, if you know, if you have knowledge of Quran and Sunnah, it is easy. If you don't have, you may, you may feel that it's, you know, very difficult. But once you read it and once you start implementing, you feel life is so balanced and mashallah, and this benefits you in this dunya and also in your akhirah. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum, doctor. Wa alaikum assalam barakatuh. My name is Haruna Muhammad Awal. Can someone be a Muslim without praying salah? Sister Haruna has asked the question Can someone be a Muslim without praying salah? Yes. The person can be a pseudo-Muslim or a non-practicing Muslim when he does not or she does not offer Salah. But the person cannot be a practicing Muslim if that person doesn't offer Salah. There is a very clear hadith in Sai Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 246, where Jabir an. He said, that may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet said that between a man and between a man and shirk and kufr is giving up of salah. A similar hadith is repeated in Jami Tirmidhi, volume 5, hadith number 2618, where it's mentioned. That Rabil Jadalan. 
Jabir may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet said that between kufr and iman, between disbelief, between a disbeliever and a believer is the abandoning of salah. That means the scholars say that if a person doesn't pray at all, he abandons salah, he abandons salah, then he becomes a kafir, he becomes a non-Muslim. So the majority of the scholars agree that based on these two hadith, both of them are Sahih authentic hadith, it's very clear cut that anyone who abandons salah, he becomes, he does kufr. But majority of the scholars believe that a person who doesn't offer salah, he becomes a kafir. However, there is another group of scholars who says that if a person who doesn't offer salah, but he believes that offering salah is fard, then he's doing a major sin, but yet he's within the fold of Islam. So basically there are two groups of scholars. One group of scholars say that a person who doesn't offer salah, he is outside the fold of Islam. This is the most strict group and this is the more correct opinion. The second group of scholars, they say that if a person doesn't offer salah, but he believes that offering salah is a fard, he is doing a grave major sin, he is doing a very grave major sin, but yet he is within the fold of Islam. So as I rightly said, that if a person doesn't offer salah, he is rightly called a pseudo-Muslim or a non-practicing Muslim, is he within the fold of Islam if you follow the stricter version among the more authentic scholars, then they say if a person who doesn't offer salah at all, he is not within the fold of Islam. But yet the other group of scholars say that if he doesn't offer salah, but yet believes offering is a farz, and he agrees he's doing a major sin, then he is yet within the fold of Islam. Hope that answers the question. Next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am a fan and follower of yours since a very young age. Alhamdulillah. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you, give you good health, and make you amongst the companions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him in Jannah. Ameen. Summa ameen. I am a 27-year-old boy from Assam, India, and I have chosen a girl for marriage with the agreement of both our families. She is working and I am not well established in terms of a stable job or business yet. So our families have agreed to marry us off once I have established myself financially. However, with the passage of time and delay in marriage, I am facing problem in terms of a fear of falling into temptation and desire along with depression as I have met the girl quite a number of times and love her very much. We want to do our nikah as soon as possible so that we become halal for each other. But our families are not agreeing to get our nikah done at present. Can we do our nikah and tell our families later so that at least we can save ourselves from falling into sin? Please provide a halal solution. Jazakallah khair. What the brother asked that he's 27 years old and he's chosen a girl and both the families have agreed that they should get married but because the boy is not financially stable, he doesn't have a stable job or a stable business, they said the marriage can be done after he has a stable job and quite some time has passed and they meet very often and they talk to each other and he started loving her so he's saying that he fear that he may fall into temptation so can they get married quietly without telling their families so that if they do something wrong it would be permissible for a marriage to solemnize the girl should have a wali and the wali of the girl is normally the father of the girl or if the father is not there, then maybe an uncle or a brother. But a wali is required for a marriage to solemnize from the girl's side. So you marrying secretly without telling the family members is not correct. It will not be accepted. What solution I can give you is that very well, you can discuss with the family members since they have agreed 
that you are going to get married and but because you're not financially stable so you may not be you know you may not be able to stay together and run an independent family that may be the reason what you can suggest them that why don't you do nikah and do the bidai later you know so there is an option in islam that you can do nikah the boy and the girl gets married the officially husband and wife but they may not live together they may do that later on maybe after a few months or a few years now that you're engaged but you're not married so she is not your wife so you cannot meet very often and talk and chit chat alone it's not allowed in islam if you're engaged yes you can talk but there should be a mahram along maybe the father of the girl or the brother of the girl or maybe your mother along you know if there is a third person and who's a mehram then when required you can talk if you're engaged but not very often when there's a requirement yes if the requirement demands if you are engaged and you may get married after a few weeks or a few months if you have to talk you can talk but there should be a mehram there should be you cannot be alone because yet you're not husband and wife because the prophet clearly said that if two na mehram are together the third person is the devil is the satan so if you are engaged yes you can talk when required with the mehram but from your question i can realize that you meet very often you may be chit chatting and you are fall in love with the falling in love with her is not a problem but meeting her often and talking this is also not permitted so the best solution that i can give is you can consult with your parents and or say and you can agree with them that since you are not financially stable you cannot run a family independently but because you talk very often and it's not permitted in islam why don't you do the nikah now once you do the nikah it's not compulsory that you start staying together immediately you can delay for a few weeks or for a few years this is permissible but once you do nikah she is officially your wife and then you can talk with her they need not be a mehram when you're when you're speaking together or when you're meeting it is secure so i'm sure if you convince your family members and the family members of the girl surely they would not mind in this solution that you do nikah you officially have been wife but you do the bidai the departure the the girl departing and coming and staying with you that can be delayed by a few weeks or a few months or a few year depending upon the requirement that is the best halal solution so even the family they happy you may not be financially secure yet when you meet you not doing anything haram you can be in seclusion you can talk to each other because you husband wife you may not be living together so this is the best halal solution that i can offer hope that answers the question we have on the facebook nusrat khan nishu sheikh joinal i love you i love you too mohammad sifat khan assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam mohammad abidullah shobo adil yasin jazakallah wa iyakum mohammad jani Peer Aqib Sayyid Love from Kashmir Akram Khan Jazakallah Khair Wiyakum Muhammad Sifat Khan S Bethany Daniel Harris Sheikh Joinal Momin Midya I love you I love you too Zubeda Aziz Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam Salim Shaju Many of them are doing dua I do dua for you too On the YouTube you have Yusuf Princess Anu Sujit Singh Rana Fat Fatuma Kosi Dahud Musa Muhammad Abadi Aisha Dopovkar Imu Islam 
Mamadou Bobo, Tanbir, Tanbir, Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam, Nefsi Tepe, Junaid Khan, Samuel Famin, Subbul Naz, Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. Zainab Kastil. Tanbir Tanbir. Kyun Queen Honey. Ilyas Sunny. Masood Alam. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. Many of them are doing duas. I do duas to you too. There's a question on the YouTube from Princess Anu. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum, hamdulillah, barakatu. Wa alaikum assalam, hamdulillah, barakatu. I am from Pakistan and I wanted to know is online nikah valid and if yes then what are the conditions for it? The question is is online nikah valid and yes it is valid as far as the conditions are fulfilled and since now there is a pandemic there are COVID restrictions and if you do there is no problem at all. The same requirements that are there for a normal nikah that is that in a nikah normally the groom, the boy who is going to get married is there and there is a wali present on behalf of the bride. So even in online nikah, there is a wali required to be from the side of the bride. Most probably it is the father, if the father is not available, maybe uncle or maybe elder brother. If these two are required, then there is the qadi, there is the person who solemnizes the nikah and the, it's preferable to have a, a qutbah, a nikah qutbah, and, but natural after the qutbah, then the person who solemnizes the nikah, whoever the qadi or the person is there, he asks the, the boy, whatever the requirement is there, that is he willing to marry, then he puts the name of the girl, who is the daughter of so and so, he takes the name of the boy, takes the name along with the name of his father, that he is the son of so and so, are you willing to marry the girl, the name of the girl, who is the daughter of so-and-so, with the maher? And whether the maher is given on the spot or given later as mentioned there. And then he says, if he says kabule, that means he has accepted it. Then the person who solemnizes the nikah, the qadi, he asks a similar question to the wali of the girl, most probably the father of the girl, or maybe an uncle or the brother. And he asks the same question that, that do you agree, are you willing to marry your daughter and take the name of the wali, are you willing to marry your daughter and the name of the daughter to the boy, mentioning the name of the boy and mention the name of his father with the amount of maher and if the wali says yes kabule, then the marriage is solemnized. So how it happens normally, the same thing can take place even online, on a video conferencing, on a zoom or a, a whatsapp video call so as long as the identity is 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 verified who is the person etc it's possible and for documentation but natural signatures are required but in islam the witness is sufficient and 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 there are some witnesses from from both the side if these conditions are fulfilled that the person who solemnizes the qadi is there and the boy is there and the wali of the girl is there and and there are two witnesses from from both the side if they are there then the nikah can get solemnized and for documentation depending upon which country or form what the rules and regulation of that country have to follow the signatures are taken but as far as islam is concerned these requirements are sufficient it can take place online especially when the covid restrictions are there and when you cannot get gathering or cannot have together 
Many countries, including Malaysia, have given the fatwa that it's permissible as long as the requirements are fulfilled as per the Islamic Sharia, and most of the Islamic countries have permitted that. Hope that answers the question. There's a question from the YouTube. The name of the, of the YouTuber is Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, my name is Bitu Shah. I am 15 years old. I was a Hindu and now I became Muslim, alhamdulillah. But my parents are against Islam. What should I do? Please help me, sir. Bitu Shah says on the YouTube that he's 15 years old, he was a Hindu and now he, accepted, now he has accepted Islam, but his parents are against Islam, what should he do? The best, and I always give this answer that Alhamdulillah, Allah has guided you. I would like to congratulate you that you have accepted the deen of Haq, the religion of truth, and I welcome you to the fold of Islam. Regarding your parents not liking Islam and they're against Islam, what should you do? Number one, is that you should be a more obedient son to your parents than what you were before. The golden rule is that whatever your parents tell you, which is against the Islamic Sharia, which is against Quran and Sayyid Hadith, only those things you don't follow. The remaining else, which is not against the Sharia, my request to you would be that you should follow it. You should be a better son than what you were before. For example, your mother wants you to wear blue color and you don't like blue color. But in Islam, blue color is optional. So now that you've accepted Islam, you have to obey your parents. And it is a requirement that a Muslim should be obedient to the parents, you should love the parents, should take care of them. So now you start wearing blue color. Whatever maybe previously you used to listen to your parents 50%, now you try and follow them 95%. Only those things which are not permitted in the Sharia, besides that, all you should follow them. And go out of the way, be more loving to them, be more caring to them. They should say, what has happened to my son? How has he changed in these last few days or few weeks? There should be a marked difference. So when they realize, then you can say that, you know, I have accepted the faith of Islam and my religion says that you have to be obedient to your parents, you have to love them, you have to be kind to them, you have to listen to them, you have to take care of them. They should find the difference. And then later on, you can slowly and slowly talk about Islam. You can refer to my video cassette, Similarities Between Islam and Hinduism. There's also a book written by me. And if you go on the Alida platform, there is a course on Similarities Between Islam and Hinduism. This will give you a lot of information how you can speak to your Hindu parents and how to convince them, how to get them closer to Islam by quoting the Hindu scriptures also. You have to first speak about the Tawheed. Number one that you have to try and remove from the life of your parents is Shirk. That they should worship no one but one true God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then believe that the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So you can refer to my video cassette, similarities between Islam and Hinduism. Or if you go to the Alida platform, there's a full course on that and there are notes, there's a study guide, there are references given. It will be easy for you to read them and quote them and show the books. You have to be kind. If they hate Islam, you should not hate them. You should love them and you should have sabr, you should have patience. And inshallah, inshallah, if you deal with them with kindness and love, inshallah, I feel they will accept Islam. And this formula I've used with various, with umpteen number of reverts, whether they are Hindus, whether they are Christians, and most of them have been successful. That they try and convince the family members, besides the parents, the brothers, the sisters, and alhamdulillah, do it with hikmah, 
as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125. Invite all to the way of their Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. So if you talk to them with hikmah and husna, beautiful preaching, they will believe. They will agree with you. And you have to remember that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. You have to love your mother, you have to respect your mother, you have to obey your mother. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, that Allah has ordained that you worship none but Him. That you be kind to your parents. And if one of them or both of them reach old age, do not say off to them, but rather lower to them your wing of humility and pray to the Lord that bless them as they cherish me in childhood. That means if one of them or both of them reach old age and if they do any tantrums or do anything, the Quran is very clear cut, you can't even say off to them. So the only time that you can disobey is when they tell you to do something against the Sharia. So in this way, inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He give you the guidance, may He give you the courage. May you give you the hikmah to deliver the message to your parents and your family members. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may your family members, all of them, including your parents, they accept Islam and may Allah put you and your family in Janita Firdos. Allah Allah. Hope that answers the question. The next question. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Azizur Rahman from Madurai, Tamil Nadu, India. I am a student of automobile engineering. One, Allah says in the Quran, we created human and jinn only for worshipping me. From this verse, jinn also worship Allah. So both the human beings and the jinns worship Allah. Now I come to my question. Do jinns also do dawah to other jinns like human beings? If they do, I think jinn society also has some great Islamic scholar like you. Two, do jinn have same Quran like us and do jinn also follow the principle of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Jazakallah. What the brother is quoting, is quoting a verse from the Quran from Surah Dhariya, chapter number 51, verse number 56, where Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبْدُونَ That we have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. This is the verse of the Quran, and the Quran does say that Allah has created the jinn and the human beings not but to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, yes, you are right. There are jinns. And the jinns have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the question was, that do jinns do dawah among themselves? Yes, they have to do. There are good jinns and there are bad jinns. The good jinns are those that are following the commandments of Allah and the Prophet. And the bad jinns are those who are not following. So, jinn can do dawah to one another. So your question was that will they have great Islamic scholars like me? I don't consider myself to be a great Islamic scholar. I'm a Dai. Yes, surely they will be having jinns who are Dai's, who are scholars, who may be talking to one another. And this is mentioned in the Quran. There's, there's a full surah by the name of Surah Jinn, chapter number 72 in the Quran. And it starts by saying, Surah Jinn chapter 72 verse number 1, that there is a group of jinn who listen to the Quran and they say that what a wonderful recital is this. And the verse number two says that they are the one who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, and, and the surah continues. So but natural, like the human beings, the jinn have a free will. And there are jinn which are good, there are jinn which are bad. And Allah says in the Quran, in the last chapter, Surah Nas, chapter number 114, was the last verse that there are some who whisper in the heart 
and withdraw. Among them, there are jinn and men. Talking about, Allah says, Kulya, I, no. that Allah says, say, Kulla usbira bin nas, malaikin nas, ilahin nas, min sharul wasfasil kan nas, alladhi yuwasfisu fi sudurin nas, min al jinnati wan nas. That say to the Lord of mankind. And it says in the ending that there are those who, referring to the Satans, they whisper in the hearts of the men and they withdraw. Among them, there are men and jinn. Referring to that these people, referring to the Satan, who whisper and withdraw, they are amongst the men and the jinn. So there are good jinn, there are bad jinn, there are jinn who do dua, uh, they do dawa also. I agree with you. Do they have to follow the Quran? Of course, this Quran has been revealed to the whole of humankind as well as the jinn. Do they have to follow Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Of course. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anbiya chapter number 21 verse number 7 وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the words, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to the whole of humankind and jinkind. So when it says وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him as a mercy to all the worlds. Talking about the world of human being, the world of jinn, and all the other world. So yes, the men and the human beings and the jinn, they have to follow the glorious Quran and the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that's the question. The next question. My name is Adil Ahmad from occupied Kashmir. I cheated in 12th standard exam in two subjects out of five subjects with three marks each in both subjects. After that I completed my BSc with, with a good percentage. Now to get a government job we have to qualify a competitive exam at state level. If I qualify in that exam is my job halal or haram? Brother Adil has asked a question that in his 12th standard exam he cheated out of the 5 subjects in 3 subjects out of, out of 5 subjects he cheated in 2 subjects for 3 marks each but later on he passed his BSc, did his graduation and he got good marks now to get a job he has to appear for a competitive examination and if he passes he will get the job so will his job be halal or haram? What cheating you did in the 12th standard, that is haram. It is prohibited. What you can do? You can ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask for forgiveness. For forgiveness you have to agree what you did is wrong. You should see to it, don't do it again. You see to it that you agree it is wrong. And if you can do, undo it, you can undo it. But now you cannot do anything. And since I think it was only three marks, it will not make a major difference. But whatever you did, it was wrong. But later on in the 12th, after you passed the 12th standard, you did a graduation. And in your graduation, you got good marks. Alhamdulillah. Now when you sit for the competitive examination for a government job, see to it you don't cheat. And inshallah, if you qualify, you'll get a good job and this job will be halal. What you did in the past many years back, it's wrong. Ask for forgiveness. Inshallah, Allah will forgive you. This will not be any problem in your job because not that you are not qualified for the job because the examination for the job you will be sitting now and you have passed your graduation. So inshallah you can ask for forgiveness and inshallah Allah will forgive you and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you get good results in this competitive examination and you get a good halal job after that. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Raith Basit. I am from Kerala, India. I am 11th grade student. My dream and passion is to become a dai like Mufti Mink, Sheikh Ahmed Didat and you. So I would like to learn 
Islamic Sharia course. But my parents are forcing me to do engineering. They say that I cannot be successful if I am not having a professional degree. But I believe that Allah is the Razak and he makes those people successful whom he wills. What should I do? Should I obey my parents and go for engineering which I hate? Or should I learn Islamic Sharia? Please answer my question. Don't avoid me as there is don't avoid me as there is not much time remaining to choose. Jazakallah khairan. Brother Rice is in the 11th standard and his parents want him to become an engineer. They say that unless you don't take a good profession, you cannot be successful in life. I don't agree with your parents totally, but taking a good degree and a good profession is important. But I don't agree with them that you cannot be successful. And you don't like engineering. Your passion is to become a dai like Mufti Meng or Sheikh Didad or like me. And you want to do a course in Islamic Sharia. What should you do? Should you obey your parents and do engineering which you don't like or you should do Islamic Sharia? Number one is that you have to try and convince your parent that your choice of doing Islamic Sharia is not only good for you but good for them also. What do you have to tell them that you do agree that okay fine if you do some engineering maybe you may be able to earn some more money in this dunya but you have to convince them that according to the glorious Quran and according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Allah says, Waman ahsanu qala mimman dhoil Allahi wa amilu salihau wa qala inna nimil muslimin Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, who works righteousness and says that I am Muslim. According to the verse of the Quran, Dawah is the best profession for any Muslim. It's better than anything else. You have to ask your parents that was the beloved prophet an engineer? And the answer is no. What was he? He was a messenger of Allah and his main profession was doing dawah. So there's no better profession than being a dai. You have to convince your parents that the best profession for a Muslim is dai. And you rightly said that Allah is razakh. He is the one who gives the risk. And Allah has already written 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth, what risk will a person get? So whether you become a dai or an engineer or a doctor, whatever you do, your risk is written. So that you have to convince your parents. And there are many talks I have given on dawah. There are many answers I have given on dawah is the best profession. You can surely learn this answer or make your parents listen to that. So number one, convince them that dawah is the best profession. Number two, our beloved prophet said that when a person dies and when he's buried, everything is gone except three things remain after a person dies. Number one is the knowledge that he has spread. If it's beneficial to someone, it is sawab jariya After he dies, if he's given some lectures, if he's written some book, etc. So whatever knowledge that he has shared and if that continues benefiting people, he will keep on getting sawab jariya Number two, the wealth he has spent in some charity or some good cause, maybe he made a hospital, maybe he made an orphanage, maybe he made a madrasa, he gave charity for some good work. If that work continues, he gets sawab jariya And the third is pious children praying for the parents. So you tell that if I become an engineer or if I become a dai, if I become an engineer and I pray for you, there are less chances the prayer will be accepted as compared to if you become a dai. The hadith says pious children praying for you. So if I'm more pious, if I follow, if I offer my salah and do the proper ibadah and do dawa, the chances that it will benefit you is much more. So if I become an engineer and maybe I earn a lot of money and do dua, that will not be that effective as I become a dai and I continue spreading the message. You are getting the sawab. Whatever people I correct and get them on the right track. Besides me giving sawab, you are getting sawab. If I pray for you after become a dai, there will be more benefit for you. So number one, convince them that dawah is the best profession. 
Number two, convince them that it will benefit them more in the akhirah. And in this dunya also. Allah says that if you ask for this dunya, I will give you this dunya, but not akhirah. If you ask for akhirah, Allah will give you akhirah as well as this dunya. So if you convince your parents, and you can refer to various answers of mine and talks of mine, inshallah, inshallah, they'll get convinced. But it is your hikmah. How well you convince, how well you speak. And I'm sure that if you speak well, your parents will get convinced and they will agree. But according to me, yes, you doing Islamic Sharia is much better than you doing engineer. It will not only be beneficial for you in the Akhirah, it will also be beneficial for you in this dunya. It will be benefit for you. So my advice to you would be that if you have the passion for Dawah, if you want to become like Mufti Menk or Sheikh Didat or like me, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may you fulfill your wish. And you have rightly said that doing Islamic course is much beneficial. The best advice I can give you is that the best university you can join is in Saudi Arabia. You can apply either to Islamic University of Medina or, or to Ummul Qura or to Imam Muhammad bin Saudi University or any other general university in Saudi Arabia. All general universities, whether it be in Saudi University, etc., they have Arabic courses and they have Islamic courses also. So you can do first the Arabic language and then do bachelors in Sharia or whichever you prefer. So the best for me advice for you would be that you apply for this. Don't apply only in one university, apply in as many as possible, 10, 15, 20 universities in Saudi Arabia. Inshallah you may get one. If you can't get there, you can apply to a university in Qatar or maybe in Sharjah or in the UAE, in the Gulf country, best is Saudi Arabia, then would be Qatar or UAE, then other Gulf countries. If not, you can even apply in Malaysia. There's an Islamic International University, IIUM. Islamic International University of Malaysia, which is amongst amongst the non-Gulf universities. Alhamdulillah, it's a good university, but natural to get scholarship is possible in the in the Gulf countries. You have to apply, but there was previously scholarship in the IIUM, but now it's very difficult. They only give to the Malaysians, but the fees aren't very high, and if you can afford it, you can also come to Malaysia or any other but see to it that you join a university which is reputed and preferable you do your course in Arabic language that's the best because that will give you more ease to understand the Quran the Sahih Hadith and the books of the Arabic scholar so so your decision is right I would pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he help you in convincing your parents and may give you admission in a good Islamic university so that you can be a, a practicing and effective die. Hope that answers the question. The question posed on the YouTube from Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. My name is Abdullah from Pakistan, Lahore. I am a student. Is it halal for me to earn money on the business my father built by taking loans from banks, which includes interest? Regarding a question that can you involve in the business which your father has built by taking loans from banks and paid interest? If, if you take care of your business and you say that, inshallah, I want to make that business halal. And if you see to it that, okay, I will join the business, I'll help my father and see to it, I repay all the loan. Or if I convert the loan from a conventional bank to an Islamic bank, which is riba free, that's the best. So if you want to help your father and see to it that you want to join the business of your father, see to it that your intention should be that you make the business Sharia compliant. If your father has taken loan from conventional bank, the best is to repay the loan. If you have the money, 
if you have the ability see to, to convince your parent to convince your father that you should repay the loan immediately maybe you have in somerset you have some extra apartment you have some property convince your father the best is that give away the loan so the interest will stop riba will stop the second option is you convert that loan from a conventional bank to an islamic bank the conventional bank deals with riba the loan you take you pay interest on it the islamic bank they believe in profit and loss sharing or they believe in other things like cost plus or moraba so depending upon so you take the loan from a islamic bank and the service charge that you pay may be same may be a little bit more no problem even if you have to pay 1% 2% 3% loan depending upon the service charge it is preferable you convert that loan from a conventional bank to an islamic bank then the business would be halal taking loan on interest is not permitted it's a major sin in islam allah says in the quran in surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 278 and 279 that give up your demands of riba if you give up not your demands of riba then take notice of a war from allah and his rasul taking riba taking interest or giving interest it is the 12th major sin in islam in the book by imam adabi al qabair 12th major sin and allah says in the quran surah baqarah chapter 2 verse number 1 verse number 278 and 279 that if you give up not a demand of riba allah and his rasul will wage a war against you having alcohol is a major sin but allah doesn't say in the quran or the hadith that allah will wage a war against you so taking riba is a much bigger sin it is the 12th major sin in islam it is that allah and his rasul will wage a war against you and a beloved prophet said that there are 70 levels of riba and the lowest level is like doing zina with your mother it is so bad imagine so you have to convince your father that riba taking and giving is haram and convince him to see to it that he repays the loan immediately if they have said if not convert it from a conventional bank which is riba based interest based to an loan from an islamic bank that is permissible according to me best is not to take a loan it is the best so if you have a set repay that and then build your business allah will give barka but as a last resort if you have to take loan then see to take from an islamic sharia based bank hope that answers the question The next question Said Khan from Pakistan If the baby in the mother's womb is found hydrocephalus at the age of 5 months and the doctor advises to abort the baby in the mother's womb is it permissible in Islam to do so please comment on this according to islam according to the doctor's verdict this baby will become handicap and will be on bed and may not survive please reply in the light of islamic teaching when the said khan from pakistan i said that if there is a lady who's pregnant and the child in the womb of the mother is 5 months old and the doctor have diagnosed hydrocephalus and and the doctor say that that the baby will become handicap and there are less chances that the baby will survive so in this case can you do abortion is it permissible generally abortion is haram it's not permitted generally the only way that the abortion is permitted is to save the life of the mother if the life of the mother is in danger and a certain complication takes place and the only way to save the life of the mother is to abort the child then it is permissible otherwise in genuine circumstances abortion is haram allah says in the quran in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 31 and 
in Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 151 kill not your children for want of sustenance for it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will give sustenance to you and your child for it is Allah who will give sustenance to your child and you both the verses are there so based on this verse kill, killing your children aborting your children is haram unless to save the life of your mother now according to Fuqahas and the scholars they say that if the child that the mother is carrying is found to be in grave danger or is handicapped or has some congenital defect if this is found before 120 days that means if the conception has taken place if it is before 120 days old fetus then for medical reason generally abortion is haram but for medical reason if you find that the fetus would be handicapped or the fetus would be abnormal and there will be complications in this case because the hadith says that the soul is blown by the angel into the baby on the 120th day on the fourth month that's the time when the soul is blown maybe it becomes a human being so before that the fetus is alive but the soul is not there so if before 120 days if the medical doctors advise that abortion should be done then take advice of at least three medical doctors and if all three agree that the abortion is the only solution before 120 days no problem if the person has hydrocephalus or has some congenital defect before 120 days the scholar says it is permitted but once the soul has been put into the child into the fetus into the baby in the womb of the mother then it is under any circumstances abortion is not allowed except if the life of the mother is in danger is in danger because once the baby has formed and has become a human being and so soul has been blown then you cannot take life it is as though you have killed a human being before 120 days okay fine you're taking life but not of a human being if there's valid reason and if the doctors say it's permitted but after 120 days it's not permitted as the question says five months have passed so in this case abortion is not permitted only if the life of the mother is in danger if the doctors say that if you continue with the pregnancy the mother has got heart problem or the delivery problem she will die so here the here the sharia rule applied is let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss the life of the mother is more important than the life of the baby so here you can abort the child but if the life of the mother is not in danger and if the baby is handicapped and you have come to know after fifth month after 120 days and the doctors say that he may not survive no problem he may be handicapped. Here you have to leave it to Qadar Allah. After 120 days have passed, the soul has been blown. You cannot take life of a human being. You leave it to Allah. If he's born handicapped, it's a test for you. Allah wants to test you. That do you yet pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after a child, child is born handicapped or child has some congenital defect or has some heart problem. This is a test for you. So if this is a test for you, you have to undergo it. You cannot abort the child. You cannot say that because the child be handicapped. If the child is handicapped, it's a test for you. If the doctor say he will die, okay, let him die on its own. But you cannot kill the child. You cannot abort the child. Once 120 days have passed, abortion is prohibited unless the life of the mother is in danger. Hope that answers the question. There's a question on the YouTube from Kwakye Steve. Please, I want to convert to Islam, but my parents will not allow me. So what can I do to convert? Please help me, doctor. A similar question is posed on the YouTube, but the name is Drugstore5. How can I convert to Islam? 
regarding the question that the non-Muslim has asked the first question that I want to convert to Islam but my parents are not willing, what should I do? First I would like to know what is your age and in different countries the age of adult differs in some countries, 18 years, some it is more, some it is less. So if you have reached the age in which you are an adult and if your parents also disagree yet you can go ahead and you can convert accept Islam and there is not a problem. If you have not reached that age and maybe one year is left or two years left or three years left, yet in Islam you can accept the deen, maybe it will not be permitted by the law in that country. In this situation, I would advise you that you can go to an Islamic organization, go and consult them and inshallah they will help you out and show a solution. But if my suggestion to you would be that if your parents are against and if you are younger than age, no problem, at least share the shahada. Say, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger and servant of Allah. You say the shahada and you are a Muslim. You don't have to convey to anyone, you don't have to tell the world. It is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you fear that the parents will get angry and they will create a tantrum, etc., the least you can do is you agree. You say the shahada, you bear witness and tell to Allah alone, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and you bear witness that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger and servant of Allah, you become a Muslim. You, there is no somni required and you start practicing Islam, you start offering salah, no problem. If your parents are not willing, you see to it, you can pray in seclusion, you can lock the room of your room and then pray or when you go outside, see to it that you have a friend circle that are Muslims, that will help you out and it would be good. As far as the second question you pose the question you want to enter Islam, how sh you want to accept Islam, how to go about. My advice to you would be that whichever part of the world you are living in, inshallah there will be an Islamic center, whether you are living in a Muslim country or living in a non-Muslim country, go to the nearest Islamic center that you know of and meet the brothers of that center and surely they will help you out it will be easy if you don't want to proclaim as I said in my earlier part of the answer you say the shahada that you bear witness that there is no God but Allah and you bear witness that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the messenger and servant of Allah you can say it in your language say it in English you can say it in Arabic you can go and see my videos where I have given shahada you can repeat it that is sufficient but to be practically following Islam, it's preferable you go to the nearest Islamic organization or to an Islamic organization which is well known and you know is correct, following Quran and Sunnah. You'll have, you make friends amongst the Muslim or you may already be having Muslim friends. They will help you to practice your deen. It will be easier for you to, to offer salah, to fast during the month of Ramadan. If you have a lot of excess wealth, you have to pay zakat. If possible, you can do Hajj as soon as possible. So these things will help you get attached to an Islamic organization. They will support you and it will become easier for you. But in both the cases, least you can do is say the Shahada, accept the Deen and follow as much as you can and slowly and slowly you increase in your Ibadat, in your following. Inshallah, Allah will accept it. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may He put both of you in Jannah al-Firdaus al-Allah, in the, in the company of the Prophet. Amen. And may he make it possible through you that may he convince your parents and your siblings, your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, to accept Islam and may he put, inshallah, your full family in Jannah al-Firdaus. Hope that answers the question.
द क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द फेसबुक मोहम्मद रफसान हसन मासूम असलम वालेकुम सर वालेकुम असलम वरक माय नेम इज मोहम्मद रफसान हसन मासूम आई एम फ्रॉम बांग्लादेश माय क्वेश्चन इज विल यू नॉट गिव पब्लिक लेक्चर्स ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड लाइक बिफोर मिस यू सो मच रिगार्डिंग अ क्वेश्चन दैट विल आई गिव पब्लिक लेक्चर्स ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड लाइक बिफोर and you know it's been 2 years it started maybe in march march 2020 exactly 2 years from now now it is march 2022 where this covid 19 pandemic it started towards the end of 2019 but it became more prevalent in march 2020 where most of the countries all over the world started having lockdowns and in march and april most almost all majority of the countries they had lockdowns and from there the restriction started and all public gatherings have stopped in most parts of the world recently since few months we have realized that there are some social gatherings sports have started gatherings have started and in malaysia the restriction is very high mashallah covid 19 has been uh has been contained to great extent malaysia has fought the pandemic very well alhamdulillah it's among the top countries and even here the large gatherings have been prohibited alhamdulillah summa alhamdulillah two months ago on the 15th of january i gave a public lecture in perlis i think it was the first public lecture on religion that the government allowed in public and the mufti of perlis mashallah is very close to me he had called me for a uh, a public lecture so i went to perlis but the authorities did not allow more than 1000 people they allowed maximum 1000 people and the gates were shut not bad alhamdulillah so there were about 1000 people for my talk in perlis on 15th of january it was the first public lecture that was allowed in malaysia after the pandemic started so i've but natural for two years i did not travel the last i remember that uh, i was in qatar in 2019 but after that i have been traveled outside the country because of the pandemic and now the restrictions are mashallah there are travels allowed in different countries but yes i did give many lectures in this two years in malaysia in different venues but the gatherings were small but this large gathering a public lecture was two months back i have got an invitation from other parts of malaysia so in malaysia alhamdulillah I started in other parts of the world it will take time but natural you asked me can i give lecture all over the world i have i take precaution you know after the allegation that the indian government has made against me because of my successful dawa in india i do travel to those countries which are more islamic friendly and those which are not very close to india and those who know me well unless i don't get an invitation from the head of state or from the home minister i don't go to that country because for safety reasons but alhamdulillah i had invitation from many countries before covid 19 but because of covid 19 the restrictions now when the restrictions do open up i yet have got countries i have got many uh, invitations not only from muslim countries even from non muslim countries and depending on the situation depending which is more feasible where it's easier i will decide in this year but i intend giving lecture at least in couple of countries outside outside malaysia also and i pray to allah subhanahu wa taala that may he make it possible like before where we can have large gatherings i remember in the year 2019 I had given a talk in Kelantan in Kota Baru in the stadium where hundred thousand people had gathered. It was one of the largest or the largest Islamic gathering in the world for any day. And inshallah, once the COVID restrictions end, maybe in Malaysia it will take longer. If not this year, maybe next year. And inshallah, we pray that even in Malaysia we have large gatherings like the way we had before in Kuala Lumpur. I've got a bar over tens of thousands of people, hundred thousand people gather, and outside Malaysia also I have plans of traveling 
if not to many, at least a couple of countries, inshallah, seeing the pros and cons, what are the situation of COVID-19. So do pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may we be able to give large public lecture. But one advantage that has taken place because of this COVID-19, because of this pandemic is, I have started giving lectures online. I started the question and answer session, which I never used to have before. And initially it was, mashallah, once a week. During Ramadan it was twice a week, became once a week. And now because of my busy schedule, I've increased the timing from one and a half hour to two hours and have it once a fortnight. And my son, Sheikh Farik Naik, he takes on the other alternate week. He handles for about an hour, but I handle for more than two hours. So approximately, not the same, but similar to once a week. The rest of I'm having I'm once a fortnight, but for longer duration. And there are other programs that would be possible in this pandemic. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may increase the effort of da'wah and that's the reason we started this new platform al hidaya and alhamdulillah pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he bless this and I would like to mention one more thing that in this month of Shaban mashallah Shaban has already started it started since yesterday in Saudi Arabia and most of the other parts of the world today was the first day of Shaban in this new platform venture that we did of al hidaya which is, alhamdulillah, the largest and the best quality Islamic courses platform in the world and the Islamic video on demand platform. What we have done that in this month of Shaban and the following month, Ramadan, we have given a special discount. And we will be reducing, though the subscription, the monthly and the annual subscription is quite reasonable, but during the month of Shaban, and Ramadan, which is starting from yesterday to the next two months, inshallah, we are giving a 50% discount. So people can subscribe. Those who are non-Muslims, we give them free. Those who are reverts also, we give them complimentary. And for those of student of knowledge and dais also, we have got sponsored. People sponsor for their subscription. But for general Muslim ummah, this is the opportunity we are giving 50% discount on all subscriptions. Whatever the reduced rates were, it slashed to 50% so that people, you know, have a better opportunity, you know, and we have given that grab this opportunity of the Ramadan and Shaban offer 50% discount half way closer to guidance. The next question <coughs> from Aisha from Herat, Afghanistan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If we have said bad things about a person in the past and he's not aware, should we apologize to him? And if we cannot apologize to him, what should we do for Allah to forgive us? If we pray for him, Will, he, will we be forgiven? Maybe we said something bad about a person and we forgot about it or someone died and we cannot apologize to him. Jazakallahu khairan kathiran fi dunya wal Wayyakum. The sister of Afghanistan has a question that if we have said some bad things about a person then should we apologize to the person or if you don't apologize, is it okay? Will Allah forgive us? And if you don't have a chance to apologize and the person dies, what should we do? But natural giba, backbiting, is amongst the major sins in Islam. And the Prophet has said in the hadith that 
do you know who is the person who's bankrupt? So people, the Sahaba said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you know the best. So he said, the bankrupt person is the person who has gathered a lot of good deeds, had done a lot of ibadah, but on the day of judgment, his good deeds will be given to the person who he has backbited. And after all his good deeds are completely become zero, yet if there is balance of giba, balance of backbiting, then the bad deeds of the person who he has backbited will come onto him. So backbiting is a major sin in Islam and a person should stay away from it. There was a person who asked that, the Prophet, that what if we say about someone behind his back, something which is true. So the Prophet said, if it is true, then it's called backbiting. If it is not true, it is bautan, it is scandal monging. It's a much major sin. So backbiting is something which you say which is correct, but behind someone's back. What you should do? The best is that if you can go to the person who, who you have backbited against and you apologize to him and ask for forgiveness, that is the best. And also ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best in the case of backbiting is go to the person, explain to him, okay, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, I've done a sin, please forgive me. And if he forgives you, that is the best. And you ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, also it is the best. But scholars say, that if the person doesn't know also, if you go and apologize, it's the best. But if the person doesn't know, and by going and telling him that you have backbited, if it's going to create a bigger fitna, then you can avoid. If you know that the person doesn't know you have backbited, and if you go and explain to him, it will be a bigger fitna, there will be animosity between you and him. In this case, then you can avoid and only ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pray to Allah that may he forgive you. You ask the question that what if someone dies and you could not ask for forgiveness, what should you do? Even in this case, if you cannot reach the person or if the person has died, you have to ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in asking forgiveness, as I mentioned earlier, that you agree it is wrong. You see to it that you don't backbite anyone else after that. See to it that you stop. If you can undo me, if you can apologize, that's the best. But you cannot apologize, okay? Ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Agree it is wrong. Stop it. See to it, don't do it again. Agree it's a sin. And apologize if you can. If you can't, no problem. Pray to Allah. And inshallah, inshallah, Allah will forgive you. Hope that answers the question. The next question, Firoz Khan, a businessman from Birmingham, UK. The Quran says that only Allah knows what is the sex of the child in the womb of the mother. Now science has advanced and with the help of ultrasonography, we can easily determine the sex of the child in the womb of the mother. Is not Quran contradicting with science? What the brother is referring, is referring to a verse of the Quran, which is the last verse of Surah Luqman. And Allah says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 34, that the knowledge of the hour is with Allah alone. He sends rain where he wants, and he knows what is in the womb of the mother. And the verse continues, no one knows what will a person earn tomorrow, in which land will he die? Allah has knowledge and is, well acquainted with, and is well acquainted with all things. There are some translations or some tafasir who have mistranslated this verse of the Quran and have said that only Allah knows what is the sex of the child in the womb of the mother. This is a mistranslation or a misunderstanding or a wrong interpretation. In the Arabic verse of the Quran, there is no sex mention. It only says, only Allah knows what is in the womb of the mother. If it was there in the Quran, that only Allah knows the sex, then there's a gross error. Because we know today, science has advanced. 
There are multiple tests you can do. I being a medical doctor know very well that you can do ultrasonography or ultrasound as it's called. And you can come to know what is sex of the child. You can do some genetic testing like amniocentesis and you can come to know what is the sex of the child. You can even do certain blood tests which is easy today. So, science is advanced. But nowhere does the Quran say that only Allah knows the sex. What the Quran says, only Allah knows what is in the womb of the mother. Yes, I am aware that there are some translations, especially some Urdu translations and some tafasir which say that only Allah knows the sex. But this is not part of the Quran. It is the misinterpretation of the person translating or doing the tafsir. Here what does Allah mean? Here what Allah means that only Allah knows what is in the womb of the child. Meaning, how will the child be? Will he be good or bad? Will he be a boon for the parents or a bane for the parents? Will he go to Jannah or Jahannam? Will he be a good person or a bad person? Will he be a boon for society or a bane for society? All these things, what will be his nature? Will he be honest or would he be dishonest? This no one knows except Allah. And today, all the scientists put together with all the knowledge that they have or all the equipment that they have, no one can say whether the child will go to heaven or hell. Will he be a boon or a bane for society? Will he be good for the parents or not? You cannot. So Alhamdulillah, the Quran is right. Only Allah knows this nature. And there's one more verse in the Quran in Surah, in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 8, where Allah says, Allah knows what the female has in the womb. Again here, there is no sex mentioned. Allah knows that. So in these verses, nowhere the sex is mentioned. And the five things that are mentioned in the last verse of Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse 34, that the knowledge of the eyes with Allah alone, He sends down rain. What is, he knows what is in the womb. What will a person earn tomorrow? And where will he die? All these five things no one knows. And we know that the day of judgment, the hour, when will Qiyamah come? No one knows except Allah. Number two, He sends down rain. People may say with the help of weather bureau, you can come to know where will it rain. Hear what the refer, what the verse is referring to. Allah sends rain where He wishes. In weather bureaus, what they do, they see the clouds and then they predict where will it rain. And they are quite accurate. But that is not, that is very easy. The rain is already there in the sky and after the rain forms, then you predict where it is going to be there. Oh, so that's not. What Allah says, Allah sends the rain where he wants. And even the weather bureau are not 100% correct. But here what, the, what Allah is referring to is Allah sends rain where he wishes. And that is the reason you find some places there are famine, there is drought, some places there is flood. So this only Allah can do. No scientist can tell in advance five years after what will happen, where it's going to rain, how much will it rain. No, they cannot. They see the signs available now and based on that they predict. Number three already explained that only Allah knows what is the nature of the child in the womb. The fourth is what will a person earn. Many people think here yeah, Allah means what will a person earn in terms of money. It doesn't mean that. Here when Allah says what will a person earn is talking about the good deeds, about the bad deeds. Risk constitutes everything. What will a person whether it be good deeds, whether he learn bad deeds, whether he learn reward, whether he'll get sawab, whether he'll get a blessing, all this put together only Allah knows. And the last is, the fifth is, where and in which land will a person die? And that also Allah knows. You cannot die without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only if Allah gives you permission can you die. So all these five things what are mentioned in the Quran is correct. Only Allah knows and no one else knows. Hope that answers the question. The next question, <clears throat> Khatija Rahman, a homemaker from New York, USA. The Quran says that Allah has put a seal on the heart of the Kafirs and they will never believe. According to science, the brain is responsible for understanding, thinking and believing and not the heart. Is not the Quran contradicting with science? What the sister is referring to is verse of the Quran of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 6 and 7, where Allah says, 
innalladina kafaru those who are rejecting faith it's the same whether they want them or do not want them they will not believe and the next verse continues khatam allah qulubim allah has put a seal on their hearts and on the hearing and on the eyes is a veil and they will incur a penalty the question posed by the sister is and allah says allah has put a seal on the heart it will not make a difference whether they you want them or not they will not believe so what has heart got to do with them believing them thinking the intelligence is not in the heart it's in the brain so is in the quran wrong what if you understand that the arabic word used is kalb khatam allah qulub him qulub is the plural of kalb heart the meaning of kalb in arabic is heart one of the other meaning is intelligence and in arabic it is known that heart is also referred to as a center of intelligence and every language develops there's something like a literal meaning and one is which is the practical meaning how they use it and i can give you several examples in english language also where the literal meaning is something else and the meaning what we actually mean is something else for example the word lunatic the word lunatic the literal meaning is struck by a moon luna is moon lunatic means struck by a moon but when you look up in the dictionary you will find the lunatic means a person who is insane or a person who is mentally unstable and we know very well that the person who is mentally unstable or insane he is not struck by the moon but yet when we use in a language a doctor will also say he is a lunatic he knows very well that the moon hasn't struck him but literal meaning is something else and how we use in the language the simplest such example for example disaster disaster literally means an evil star but when you open the dictionary disaster means a calamity or a sudden loss or something grave that has happened and we know very well that when a calamity comes or a sudden loss has come it has nothing to do with an evil star yet we use the word disaster for describing a calamity or a sudden loss or some mishappening give me one more example travel travel means coming when three roads meet it's called travel it derives little meaning but if you open the dictionary travel means something which is insignificant something which is less important it has nothing to do with three roads meeting so this is how the language is spoken i'll give you a very simple example which most of us use in english we say sunrise we know very well scientifically the sun does not rise yet we use sunrise we know to then we've learned in school that it is due to the rotation of the sun in relation to it is the rotation of the earth in relation to the sun that it appears that the sun is rising we know very well the sun is not rising it is the rotation of the earth in relation to the position of the sun that it appears that sun is rising yet in english language we say sunrise the other word sunset we know that the sun does not set it is the rotation of the earth in relation to the sun it appears to us that the sun is setting we know sun does not set yet we regularly speak what is the, what is the time for sunrise what is the time for sunset we have in the newspapers all of us know sun does not rise sun does not set what we use the that language similarly in arabic language we'll come to it later on but there are many other examples in english for example we know very well that the center for emotion and for intelligence and for thinking it is the brain it's not the heart and the center for love it is the brain it's not the heart yet when we say that we love a person we say we love you from the bottom of my heart we say that we know very well that the center of love is not in the heart it is in the brain imagine a scientist telling his wife i love you from the bottom of my heart and the wife says 
you being a scientist, don't you know the basics of science? That love is not from the heart, it's from the brain. You should say, I love you from the bottom of my brain. And no Englishman says that. We know very well the center of love is in the brain. But that is how the language has developed. We love you from the bottom of the heart. Same way, we know that the center of memorization is in the brain. But when we ask someone, have you memorized this portion by heart? We say we memorize this by heart. The center of memory is not in the heart, it's in the brain. But in English language we say, I have memorized by heart. So this is how the language has developed. Similarly in Arabic, an Arab understands that the heart, the Kalb mentioned, the center of learning is in the brain, but the heart is known as center of learning. It's known as a center of love. It is known as a center of memory. So that's the reason Allah says in the Quran, Khatam Allah Allah has set a seal on the heart. So this is one explanation in English language, how we use the heart for memory, for love, for emotion. Similar in Arabic, the center, the heart is used as a center of understanding, love and emotion. That's the reason Allah says, Allah has set a seal on the heart. Allah alam, tomorrow we come to know that actually it is Allah knows best. But even using the terminology that we have today, that in English language, heart is used for center of love, for emotion, for intelligence, for memory. Similarly, Arabic is the same. So when Allah says, Allah has set a seal on the heart, no one has a problem, no Arab has a problem. And that's how we use even in the English language. Hope that answers the question. There is a question from the YouTube by Muhammad Abbadi. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. What is the best book I could give to a Christian and Jewish friend to invite them to Islam? Jazakallah khair. According to me, the best book that you can give to a Christian or a Jewish friend to invite him to Islam is, is my book on similarities between Islam and Christianity. There's also a video cassette available on that. Very shortly there'll be a course on that on the Alida platform. But this lecture of mine, you can give a video or my book on similarities between Islam and Christianity. In this, up, in this book, I've used the approach based on the Quranic verse of Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64, which I call it the master key of Dawah. Where Allah says, Qul al Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, Ta'alu ila kalimatin sawa in bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abuda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate no partners with him. Wala yittakhidha baad dun abad dun arba bin dun illa. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fa'kulu shadu. Say ibe witness. Bianna muslimoon. That we are Muslims bowing away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this book of mine, in this lecture of mine, I have taken this as the major base that tells to the Jews and Christians come to common terms as with us and you. Which is the first term, Allah na'abud illallah. Allah na'abud illallah. That we worship none but Allah. So in this book I have described about the Tawheed. The same in Quran and the Bible. We have to believe and worship only one God. Then I have spoken about the Prophet, the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad as in the Quran, as in the Bible. I've spoken about Salah, I've spoken about the pillars of Islam, and I've shown various similarities, several. And I've quoted the Quran and the reference I've given even from the Bible. I feel this is the best book and approach you can give. There are various other books, but this is the best. There's also my debate with Dr. William Campbell. It's available on video on the topic of Quran and the Bible in the light of science. I've even given I had a debate on was Christ really crucified. Even that's good. But the best book I would say is similarities between Islam and Christianity. That is apt to be given to a Christian. After that, if you want to give more books, there's also a very good book by Sheikh Ahmed Didat, The Choice. It comes in two volumes. Choice 
the choice volume one and volume two it's a compilation of the various booklets of sheikh ahmed didad there are about 15 to 20 booklets that sheikh ahmed didad wrote in these two volumes most all of these books of sheikh didad on islam and christianity have been compiled and have been printed in a book form the choice volume one volume two and this is also a very good book you can give to a Christian or a Jew and inshallah Allah this will help them to get guidance and Allah will give them hidayah question from the YouTube Husna Fatima Assalamu alaikum Dr. Zakir I have a question please answer this question it is very much necessary after talaq that is after divorce should husband return the ornaments and property that he had taken from his wife is the question that should the husband take back the ornaments he has given or should the husband return anyway in both cases um, it is mentioned clearly in the Quran that when you give divorce please, please do not take back the gifts which are given to your wife so when divorce takes place depending upon the requirement it is a very important thing that if the meher if the husband gives divorce the meher should have been given if it is not given it is compulsory you should give it meher. if he has given any gifts to the wife he should not he should not take back any gifts but if he has taken something from the wife, the question is, taking ornaments, it's not a gift, taking ornaments, then, but naturally, if he's taken it for custody or for keeping it, it's not his property, then he has to return it back because it's not his property. If he's taken some ornaments from the wife, you know, to keep in safe custody, and then if the divorce takes place, but naturally, he has to return it because it doesn't belong to him. If he has given gift, some gift to the wife during marriage or after marriage and if divorce takes place the Quran said it's preferable that he doesn't take it back so that would be the best for both of them hope that answers the question There's the next question. Irfan from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. If I give money to my parents so that they can repay their debt, will it be considered as charity? Thank you. As far as giving money to your parents so that they can repay their debts, will it be considered charity? Yes. You can very well give money to your parents so that they can repay their debt it will be considered a good deed, it will be considered charity. You can even, to an extent, you can even give your zakat money to your parent if it is to repay the loan. Normally, generally, you cannot give zakat to the people who you are responsible for. The general ruling is your ascendant and descendants. You cannot give zakat money to your mother, to your father. You cannot give zakat money to your children because the Islamic Sharia says the ascendant and descendant those who are dependent on you you cannot give zakat but what the scholars say and the general condition yeah right you cannot give zakat money to your parents or to your children because they are your responsibility but the scholars say that if your parents have taken debt the debt is not your responsibility to be paid yes Taking care of the food, lodging, clothing, boarding is the responsibility. So if they are debtors 
One of the criteria where zakat can be given according to Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60, is gharimun, is a debtor. So, if your parents have taken some loan and if they have to repay, it is not your responsibility. Your responsibility is taking care of the staying, lodging, boarding, clothing, not the debt. So, since it is not a responsibility, you can give even your zakat money to your parent to repay the debt. But if you give charity, it's better. But if you don't have enough money in charity, but you have some zakat money, you can even use your zakat money to pay the debt of your parent. That will be accepted. Zakat also will be accepted. Your charity will be accepted. If you're giving charity money, all the more better. It's a good deed and charity begins at home. Surely you can use your charity money to repay the debt of your parents. Hope that's it. Since time is running short, this will be the last question that I will handle. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Hanif Patel from London, UK. I give zakat every year in Ramadan. Do I have to complete my full zakat in the whole month of Ramadan or part in Ramadan and part after few months? Jazakallah khair. As far as zakat is considered, you can give zakat in any time of the year. There is no fixed rule that you should give in Ramadan outside Ramadan, but most of the people prefer giving Ramadan, giving zakat in Ramadan, because Ramadan is a blessed month. There is multiple times more reward. That's the reason prefer people prefer giving in Ramadan. But there is no fixed rule when zakat should be. It can be given any time of the year. The ruling is that you have to calculate zakat once every lunar year. So most of the people, they prefer giving and calculating in the month of Ramadan. So when you calculate that one day in a year should be fixed. You can keep fixed day, you can keep even outside Ramadan. But if they calculate in Ramadan, giving in Ramadan becomes easier. So my, some people keep in the first of Ramadan, some people give 15, some people give end of Ramadan. I would preferably prefer that you keep towards the mid or the end of Ramadan. Why? And you can calculate in the first of Ramadan. So you come to know what is the amount and add on the one month. Suppose you are a salaried man. You can calculate your salary that you get and, and whatever, whatever savings you have got. And you can add to the saving the one month salary there. Why I am saying in the end of Ramadan? So that zakat should be given on time. You cannot delay zakat. You cannot give zakat after the due date. Okay, so if you calculate a particular day, you have to give it before that or maybe a few days after that. You cannot give after one month or two months or five months or say, I calculate Ramadan and some people, what they do? They calculate Ramadan and they give throughout the year, which is not correct. If you want to do that, you can calculate and give in advance, no problem. You can give zakat in advance, but you cannot give zakat late. It is wrong. You have to give zakat on time. So if you want to give throughout the year, you can calculate approximately every year my zakat may be 10x. Okay, so I will keep on giving throughout the year. And in Ramadan, I give the balance amount. It's easy. Or for example, you say that my zakat has come to be $20,000. So fine, you know it's going to be $20,000. So what do you do? In advance, suppose I've given zakat of this year, the next year starts. You start giving one one thousand dollar every month for eleven months, and the balance nine thousand dollars you give in Ramadan, no problem. You can give at once. You cannot say calculate today, and then I give in Ramadan five thousand or nine thousand dollars, and every month after that I keep on giving one one thousand. I am paying zakat for the last year. This is not acceptable. You can pay zakat in advance, but not late. That's the reason I personally prefer if you calculate the end, the point as last of Ramadan. So if you calculate last of Ramadan, do the calculation for the full year. And if you know, you can give in the month of Ramadan, you're giving in advance. So if you calculate in the end of Ramadan, you know approximately how much savings you have got, 
what Sia said, you can even calculate on the first of Ramadan, but take the point as end of Ramadan. And in the end of Ramadan, you can add or deduct what is the difference. It's easier. And normally the rich people who give, they give throughout the year, though the major portion may be in Ramadan, as I told you, if they know what is their zakat, if it's $20,000, what do you have to do? You have to give in advance. Don't give late. So if you know that your zakat is $20,000, you're already given for this Ramadan, you start giving for next Ramadan after Ramadan. Then so Shawwal, when you give the $1,000, it is for the coming Ramadan. One $1,000 every month or whatever you decide. Suppose one $1,000 every month. So before Ramadan starts, in 11 months, you have already given $11,000. Then in the next Ramadan that comes, you give $9,000, total become $20,000, or whichever way you calculate. But you have to take one point for calculation and see to it that it is the same day throughout the year. It can be any day, but easier, preferable that you calculate towards the end and start giving in advance. That's the best. Hope that answers the question. And this is the limited time that we had. We have already spent more than two hours. And I would like to make an announcement that inshallah next Saturday, my son would be handling the session. Ask Sheikh Farik where he'll handle the question and session next Saturday, inshallah, same time. But after that, there will be a break. Next Saturday is 12th of, uh, 12th of March where my son will handle. But after that, on 19th of March, there will not be a session. So there will be a break for approximately two months, maybe eight sessions. We will not have the session on the 19th of March. And the whole Ramadan, we will not be having because me and my son have some commitments. So we will not be handling the session. Inshallah, we'll resume after Ramadan, inshallah. So we will be having a break from the 19th of March till the... 12th or, or, or till the 7th of of May inshallah inshallah on the 14th of May my son would again resume and have asked Sheikh Farik so there will be a gap for approximately 8 sessions we won't be having there will be a gap for approximately 2 months so the last session would be on the 12th of March and we will again have the 2 months break and again Ask Sheikh Farik on the 14th of May, inshallah, because me and my son have got some commitments. So it's the first time that we'll be taking a break. Normally we have a break every three months or once a week. Or when we had a, once a week, we had one break, you know, once or twice. But this is the first time after two years we'll be having a break because of a commitment is long. So for two months we don't have. So inshallah, we, you can attend next Saturday for my son. And inshallah, as far as I am concerned, inshallah, on the 21st of May, inshallah, we'll meet again, same time, on Saturday, 11 p.m. Malaysia, 6 p.m. Makkah time, 3 p.m. GMT. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa akhirat dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.